gotta get two shots. Okay, now this is gonna be like going out of the box, but it's gonna be like that. We'll do this one more time. Can you dig it? Yeah! Is that easy? That was that's amazing. I love that. This is on. Is this on? Is this on? We're on. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Edgebaston Cricket Ground. So, how are you all doing? You having a good day? Awesome. Great. So, you're more than welcome to ask any questions to the guys. You know, do a little Q and A type of thing. And we'll just go from there. So if you want to ask a question, just raise your hands in about five minutes. Oh, sorry, wait, in a minute. <laughs> Too quick. <laughs> I like it, though. All right, then. So we have here Dorsey, David, and Thomas from the Warriors. Let's give them a good one. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> so hi, guys. How are you? Fine. Yeah? Great. Are you okay, Thomas? I'm beautiful. Brilliant. So... <laughs> Welcome to Britain. How's your, your trip going so far? Um, great. Uh, this, is my, this is my second time here. Uh, not exactly like here, but sound like a rude American. It's the UK? Great Britain? It's the UK, right? UK. It's the UK, right. It's my second time in the UK. Because we say London, I heard, yeah, nah, 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 nah. No, but I was here in the 80s, uh, in London, in the 80s, and here now in 16, 17. You don't know what year it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, and I'm, I'm here. <laughs> and I'm here this year. Mm. Both times, I tell everybody back home. You know, uh, a couple of places I would like to retire that I've been to. I've been to a lot of spots. Canada and the UK. Both. I love the society. I I, I can't get enough. And you, neither one has LeBron. And well, no. I'm not I'm not gonna get into that, but I'm gonna tell you straight up. There may be some kids in here. You people are cool. Hear what I mean? Know what I mean? That's from the heart. Uh, just when I got off the plane, I felt so much warmth from the people of the United Kingdom, and especially our Warrior fans. I love you guys. Thanks for loving us. Yeah, I was here once before, and uh, I had a very good time, but not nearly as much fun as I'm having now. It's really great, and uh, Vic did a terrific job putting this together, because, uh, you know, we've done a few of these things, and sometimes they can be really mismanaged, and everyone ends up unhappy. But this time, he, because he was so detailed and thorough, uh, it's made it comfortable for us. I mean, I'm terribly jet lagged, but I'm still having fun. So, thanks for having us. Yeah. So the conclave scene in the beginning. I bet that was quite difficult to um, to film with all those extras. So, Thomas, um, what was what was your thing on it? What was your take? Uh, <laughs> it was a tough job for me personally. You know, I signed up to do the Warriors. I was 23 years old. It was the summer of 78, right? It was very, very hot in New York. We didn't have any air conditioning in our trailers. We showed up for work at six o'clock and we worked until six o'clock in the morning every night. And you basically just ran and ran and ran and ran again. And, you know, it got difficult, but then I got into um, some issues with the director where the movie was going and how it was being handled. And I uh, inappropriately approached him numerous times about how to do the movie. <laughs> Which always works out. For the Which always works out. Let me tell you, that's a really good idea to be a 23-year-old kid and tell a director how to do a movie. And we got over budget and behind schedule and there was a lot of pressure on us. 
And so I was released from the picture. I was fired, basically. <laughs> uh, and, um, and it was a devastating experience for me, I have to tell you. I, it woke me up in so many ways, as sometimes unfortunate things do in life. You know, uh, difficult, uh, painful things are great teachers. Pain sometimes is the great teacher. And, and I suffered a lot from that experience, but both my career and emotionally, I suffered a great deal. And I learned a lot, which is basically keep your mouth shut. No. Um, when you have difficulty, find the appropriate channels through which to communicate them rather than taking it on yourself. But it was a great experience in terms of meeting the guys, and we did have a lot of fun. And we're still friends. Uh, as uh, but, uh, Tom said, you know, it's a, we're a band of brothers. You know, uh, I went to uh, acting school with Michael Beck's wife, and uh, I introduced him to his wife because we were we were very very close. So he's the godfather to my children. I'm the godfather to his children to show how how close we are. We loved each other from day one, from day one. Walter was amazing casting this movie. The Warriors, you don't see race, color, or creed, or nothing. You just see these nine guys and our one warriorette, Deborah von Volkenberg. And that's what you see. And it gives this, this film the longevity that the film has. It applies to kids watching it for the first time that weren't even born when we shot this movie. So I'm just very proud of the film. I'm very proud of my fellow warriors. I'm proud of you guys for just the love and for seeing this movie for what it is and seeing that it's an amazing classic film. Do you know what I mean? And when you watch the film, the joy you guys get out of it touches my heart. And making the film, hey, I was a kid. I grew up in New York City on the Lower East Side. And I would not exchange this experience for anything. And I've done 19 movies and a slew of episodic television. And my experience on shooting the Warriors, as Tom said, we ran and ran and ran and ran. But you know what? I'd do it again in a heartbeat. What was the question again? <laughs> I was just saying about um, the conclave at the beginning. Okay. You know, about how all Before the... I get to the conclave, I don't know these guys. I don't like these guys. I don't hang around these guys. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> that was all a lie. The, the conclave scene itself um, was basically put together by, what was her name? The casting, the extra casting? Oh, uh, 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 Faye. Faye. Sylvia Faye. Sylvia, 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 Sylvia Faye. Sylvia Faye. Sylvia Faye was just up and coming then. I mean, she had a name for herself, but wasn't huge. So she went around New York City in the 70s, basically asking guys who looked the part, hey, you want to be in a movie? And uh, these guys decided to come up and show up. These guys were in actual gangs. Real New York City, I will rob you all I find, all I keep. That's what he used to walk up on you, gangs. But she thought it would be cool to like, hire these guys to pretend to be gangs. Um, so we brought, she brought the guys on. So it gave a realness to the whole conclave. A realness that a lot of average actors couldn't catch on to. And some of them went home. Not the regular way. That's why he kept going. Could we move it in up there? If you remember that night, Roger and him kept saying, there's a gap. Could you fill in the gap? <laughs> There was a reason why there was a gap. You as an actor, up and coming, smiling, isn't this great? Wow, it's a gang film. Hey, I'm with the hi-hats. What gang are you with? Homicide Incorporated. <laughs> that's not what it's, that's not what you laugh for, that we ran into an actual gang. And then you look at the back and say, that doesn't say Homicide Incorporated. And when the camera's not rolling, they would snatch you behind the damn bleacher take your money and send you home. 
So now Roger's going, could we fill in the gap? Not, what happened to the five people that walked in? So, so when you watch the movie, see the gap. Another real, another real quick true story. Homicide Incorporated is a gang that was in Brooklyn, New York. So we're on the beach getting ready to film in our trailer. They had like two trailers and all of us were in two different Both films. In. Right. I wasn't throughout the film, you already know. But these are my memories and they were all funny. So we're sitting in there, we're laughing and joking. You know, it's early in the morning, like four or five o'clock. So in comes James Remar. Y'all know him as Ajax, who's a method actor. So that means he stays in character till the film is over. So he comes in and he says, you know, there's some guys on our territory trying to bop through, and we got to go out there and take care of them. <laughs> you know, you're sitting there going, does this guy ever turn this off? <laughs> so we're like, yeah, 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 sure, right. He says, no, no, come on, we got to go out there. Come on, Cleon. I'm like, oh, that's me. <laughs> so we go outside. You know, I throw the rag over my shoulder because, come on, man, I'm an actor. I open the door. There's around anywhere from 50 to 60 of these guys, all up on the boardwalk. And on their back, it says, Homicide Incorporated. They're not actors. <laughs> oh. And what they want to know is, and the proof is on every DVD, look at the back where we're standing in front of the bathhouse, that building behind us that says the Warriors, and we look cool. Well, it used to say Homicide Incorporated. <laughs> So you basically came into somebody's territory and went over their name. And they want to know, who the hell are the warriors? They can say whatever they want. My vest disappeared with the quickness. I don't know these guys. I've never been around these guys. And if you want to talk to somebody, see them guys down there with the camera, with the three police officers? They were like, yeah, go talk to them. 90% of the Homicide Incorporated wound up in the conclave. Crazy. You know, quite a lot of them, you see the gangs there doing that. But, like, were you scared? You know, thinking these gangs are there going to kill me in a minute, you know? <laughs> there was one time when we had to vacate a location because they started to threaten us. And they sent a few guys over to try to pay them off. And they were like, we don't want your money. We want them out of here. And so it's very expensive to make a movie. It's very expensive to plan a movie. It's very expensive to stop a movie in the middle of it and pack up and move to a different location. And uh, that's one of the things I remember having. I remember thinking, you know, I'm just an actor. And these guys, you know, they could kick my ass, basically. I mean, I run every night, but <laughs> I, that's not going to help me. I could run away from them, maybe. Um, so it did get a little bit scary one one day. Do you guys you, do you remember that? I remember that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, because you know New York is this, it's it's a much more calm place now. But back then, it was sort of like the Wild West. There were places you just did not go, and if you did, you better carry a stick with you. A big stick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, as Tom said, uh, I remember one location where. These guys came up to the uh, production assistants, basically the first AD, and said, hey, all right, like, we gave you guys permission to film in our neighborhood on our turf, but when <coughs> lunch break and all that, you make sure they take their colors off. You don't walk around here with the colors. Take the vests off. And we had to walk around like this, like civilians. And then, you know, when <coughs> we went back to work, it was cool. but." No walking around with the vests on, on lunch break or lollygagging or none of that kind of stuff because these guys meant business, you know. So, you know, you gotta you gotta give respect if you want respect. There it is. The, the, the strange thing now is that in all of those areas, guys are walking around with warrior stuff on. <laughs> Whereas before you couldn't wear it. Now, if you wear anything other than that, there's a problem. So, you know. Hey. It is what it is. <laughs> All right, Daphne, with um, you, David, you played Cochise. Now, your look is quite exotic. You know, did you ever say in that, you know, were you originally meant to look like that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Bobby Mannix, who was the uh, costume designer, uh, her, her outlook and, and creative vision on Co Cochise was that he has to stand out. He has to be <laughs> exotic. He has to, like, be 
kind of different from the rest of the guys as far as his costume. And uh, I was the last warrior to be cast. All these guys were cast. I was out in the, mid in the Midwest doing a play, and I came back to New York, make a long story short, my, 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 my uh, agent said, hey, you're doing this movie, Walt the Hill's in town, he's doing a movie called The Warriors, uh, eh, you know, about street gangs, blah, 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 but he can't find his cold cheese. So we're gonna send you up. So I go up and I meet, uh, uh, meet Walter Hill, and I get the part. And uh, so I get down, to, he says, go down to costumes, and I meet Bobby Maddox, and she goes, look at some of my sketches, and blah, blah, blah. So I gave her a little intake about how I thought Coach E should look, but basically, basically all of her creative ideas. And when, as you guys know, when you look at his outfit, you look at Coach E's, he stands out. It's just totally different from my beloved brothers here, but Coach E's is the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, so Tom, you know, you were supposed to have, at the beginning, you had Mercy, the leading lady, um, then it went over to Swan. So was that event, uh, originally meant to be in the script, or was it because we had the problems, you got fired, unfortunately? Yes. Yeah, That's why Swan had her. <laughs> yeah, ba basically I was supposed to get the girl, and uh, Deborah and I actually auditioned together. They, they brought us, uh, back in those days, um, you, it, now, if you get called back more than three times, you have to get paid for it. Back then, you could keep calling actors back as many times as you felt like it, and it didn't matter, you know? So they brought us back, I think it was the fourth or fifth time, and they just had Deborah and I in the office with Larry and Walter, and they interviewed us, and it was uh, between me and one other actor named Alan Rosenberg. Very good actor. And um, so I got cast with Deborah, and... Uh, then you know we started to have problems, and I guess they also really liked the way Michael looked on film. You know, he was coming across very strong in the movie, and uh, you know it was more, I guess, Walter's idea of who the character was that got the girl, and so that wasn't in the script, and it wasn't even me that got thrown in front of the train. It was a grip. Do you know what a grip is? No. Yes. A grip is a guy that works on the camera crew. Anyway, they put a wig on him, a curly wig, and they pushed him in front of the train. And uh, that's what you get for being a wise ass. <laughs> so do you actually, when you were filming it, did you actually think how big it is now? Did you think it was gonna be that big? No, we, I, we never imagined that. I mean, this film was supposed to go film for nine weeks. We went five and a half months. They're like three different versions of the Warriors. We never start out at night, we start out in the daytime. Film starts out in the daytime. We go through a bunch of neighborhoods that you guys don't ever see. There's a lot of stuff that's on the, in the vault, that went on the floor. Walter shot so much, so much. And a lot of stuff you guys never saw. Uh, but we never thought the film, we'd be here in 2017 talking to you guys. At least I did. I didn't imagine that. A little film will go and come and boom. You know, I made some, what do you guys call it, ducats or, uh, what's the word here for money? Money. Money. Uh, I forgot, I forgot. Money. Universal language, money. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, shoot, I'll, you know, not go on to my next film. I, I didn't have any idea that the film would have this kind of life and it would just seems to just go on and on and on and on and on around the world. So that's the uh, Dorsey, did you think it was going to be some big thing? Hell no. <laughs> uh, I, had a, I had a 64 Mustang that I was trying to put together. Not that I'm mechanically inclined. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. But I knew I needed some more money to put this together. So my agent told me about this film called The Warriors. And it, it was probably going around to every agent with the same mentality that there's this movie called The Warriors. I mean, now it's a different story. Back then, the budget was basically, they're actually going to shoot a movie with how much, they looked down on it. Put it this way, it, it, it wasn't like, you're going to do the greatest thing in the world. So I said, okay, so what is it about? She told me. And I went down to the Gulf and Western building, which is now 
Trump Hotel. Trump Hotel. It's Trump Hotel, man. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, I'm going to throw up. Ah, no. <laughs> so I, I go to the Gulf and Western building, I go upstairs, and you know, everything was fine. And we, we talked and talked. I, I just finished a film that wasn't released. So they were talking to me like, you know, and I'm happy. You know, it's my second time out. People are treating me like, uh, I can act. So I'm like, hey, I'm good. And then they start telling me the concept. And I'm basically looking at these two guys from California going, what the hell is on your mind? This is New York. Basically, they told me there's an interracial gang, and they start naming the guys and showing me some pictures. And I'm going, I grew up in the South Bronx, G. That does not happen. So I basically called my agent and said, Meh. but then again, I had to fix this car. So I think I'm going to take the film. Then they told me Sidney Poitier's daughter would be in it, and I would have some interaction with her. I love women, what can I say? So I saw a picture of her, and it was like, I don't care what the hell I'm doing. That, I get the kiss on it, it was like, man, there's a possible chance. You have to sign me up. So I sign up. Then I go to costume, and I'm looking at guys or drawings of guys with painted faces and top hats and so, you know, it was a roller coaster of what the hell did I just get into? So, as soon as it was over, who's gonna think there's a movie with an interracial gang, a bunch of clowns running around, some guys in electric jackets, some bald headed guys that, that got a bus, God knows where they stole a the bus from, <laughs> and nine idiots who don't have a common sense to hot wire a car. Okay? <laughs> You watch the open up the film, I'm sitting there going, there's a whole gang that goes to a train station, and they're the baddest gang, I guess, in the area, but one of the idiots got a bag full of tokens, and he's actually paying <laughs> and this gang goes to the dirt stop. <laughs> I'm sitting in the movie theater going, oh, I don't want my friends to see this movie. They are going to rag me to death. So yes, I thought this is a one and done. It's over. Nobody's going to believe this. And every year goes by, you know, and hey, aren't you? Yeah. Hey, didn't you? And I'm just pulling out credits going, but did you see me? And I don't watch that movie. But what I saw you in was, and after a while, all your credits drop aside. They could care less what you did. You were in the greatest movie of all time. And I sit home in the dark going, what the hell did I just miss? <laughs> this was not the greatest movie of all time. Quickly, it humbled me to make me understand and excuse me because I'm a rude, crude American New Yorker. It don't give a damn what I think about the movie. It don't mean crud. It's what you think about the movie. I can think it's garbage. I can think I did something as the greatest thing since sliced bread. If nobody pays to see it, like the tree that falls, there you go. Nobody hears it, you're dead, man. So no, I didn't think so, but I've been proved wrong about a whole lot of stuff. Because I've been married three times. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, when did you realize it was actually this big? You know, how big it was? Uh, <clears throat> I was wrong once, but I think it was a mistake. <laughs> no, uh, um, you know, I still don't get it. Uh, I, I was in Greece, you know, on vacation in 2007. I was dating this girl, and we were walking around Mykonos, a very small island in Greece, and a guy stopped me and said, Hey man, you're Fox and the Warriors. Give me five in Greece. <laughs> and you know, I guess it was around then that it started to dawn on me that I was part of something much greater than I had ever thought it would be. And uh, and Dorsey's got a point. You know, it really doesn't matter what I think or what the critics think. I mean, I remember when it came out, uh, the critics had a lot of interesting things to say, like uh, once Thomas Waits died, the movie got less interesting. I like that critic. Uh, but I really, um, I feel that 
we have to tip our hat to Walter because he had a vision that he stuck by through a lot. I don't know if you have any idea what it's like to direct a major motion picture, but it, I don't, but it's tremendously stressful. And people are breathing down his neck from every imaginable angle. And he stuck with what he believed in. And I think that that perseverance is what prevails. And that the reason why you guys are so attracted by the movie is there's something, there's a spirit about it, a spirit of indomitability, you know, the indomitable American spirit, no offense, indomitable American spirit to get home. And I think that's largely due to the director. Stephanie, so David, um, do you think that if the film was made now, do you think it'd work? If it was made now? No. No, okay. No. <laughs> and that's for a variety of different reasons. First of all, you can't create the way New York City lived, you know, was, and the feel, and the grittiness, and the funkiness, and all of that, what happened in the city almost 40 years ago. Times Square now looks like Disneyland. When we shot the Warriors, it didn't look like that. It was a whole slutty kind of underground, kind of nasty, kind of funky, kind of I'll bite you in the ass kind of place. You know what I mean? The subways were like, get on here and I'll bite you in the ass. You know what I mean? It, 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 that's all gone. You know what I mean? The Low East Side where all the great graffiti artists and the whole look of the subway, the look of the city, that's all gone. It's gone through regenification. So, I mean, there was talk. A director, a very talented director named Tony Scott, Wrigley Scott's brother, okay, was going to do a remake of The Warriors. He, something, and he passed away. So it got shelved again. But my personal opinion is that you can't remake this film. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. There are certain films that you don't touch, okay? I believe Warriors is one of them, okay? I think a remake of this movie would be a disaster. My personal opinion, you know, if you try and put the Warriors in 2020, what is it going to look like? What, what, what? I mean, leave it alone. I hope that it's never remade. You know, I... I Certain films are just m made that you go, you know what, don't try to remake it. So many remakes are horrible. You guys are moviegoers. You've seen classical films that the remake and you go, eh, you know, shouldn't have been done. And I just don't see them going back into New York City and shooting a 2020 version of the Warriors. I don't see. That's my opinion. I just like doing that for effect. Because they all look at me like, he's going to say something stupid. I see it coming. And I'm not going to disappoint you. <laughs> I love to keep my audience riveted. Look, um, do I think or do I believe that it would be any good if they made it? I've been married three times. Did I tell you all that? <laughs> okay, so going under that premise, if there is 10 cents or a penny to be made, we all know what's going to happen. That's the way Hollywood is. If they juggle the numbers, look at the bottom line and say, if we spend five million, we can make 25, they'll have nine guys and a girl in a heartbeat and not give a darn what you think about. There's gonna be put up there on the screen because those bean counters are gonna say, even if half of them don't like it, we'll make a profit. Saying that, could it be redone? You would need the right director, the right vision, the right cast, really. No, I don't believe it can be set in any time zone 
or any real world, I'm talking about escape from New York type stuff. It would have to be that. And they would have to do it so that it was palatable, palatable to you. You understand what I'm saying? It would have to come from that type of direction. If they said, this is the world in 2057, they'd have to get you to believe it. The only way they can get you to believe that, right script, right director, right actors. But never say, I understand what David is saying. I feel that way too. But never say they're going to take a movie that you thought was a very good movie and not turn it into a piece of crap. Because that's what Hollywood does for a living. You've already seen those movies where you went and went, they should have never remade this. Who are you? I don't care about you. Did you see the numbers we pulled on that film? Yeah, but it sucked. Sucked to you by the time it got overseas? Cha-ching. I go to Box Office Mojo, which is a site, which lets me know. You spent X amount of money? Look how many times they've redone King Kong. God forbid, you know they're going to do another. They're going to do King Kong and Godzilla. They're going to do Mega Godzilla. They could care less. Because somewhere in the world, it makes money. The most you can do is, hey, if you hear about it and it's going to come up, come up, try and put some input into it as fans. You may not think it doesn't work, but trust me, it does, especially in Hollywood. If enough people write in and go, I see you're going to do this, God, hope you pick somebody who's decent. Hope you do whatever, whatever. They'll start listening because they know through the internet that will spread like a disease. So they're not going to try and put you down. They're going to try and adhere to it. But also understand, I know I'm talking worldwide, that overseas, and you are part of the overseas, that they'll look at this market and go, if it doesn't work in America, if we make a third of our profit there and make the rest overseas, we're going to shoot this. So it's not so much America that can go boo-hoo, because a lot of these movies that are coming out now are not making their money in the United States. You see United States total. It's like, oh, you almost made your money back. Worldwide distribution, three times the money. Yeah, um, if I may, uh, one thing, I don't really care if they make it again or not. It doesn't make any difference to me. It's not going to have any Im impact upon my life one way or the other. But something I don't think you know or are aware of is the fact that this was Walter's third picture. And his most recent picture was called The Driver with Ryan O'Neill. And it tanked while we were shooting, which is why the pressure increased on him tremendously. It wasn't doing what, and it was a good movie, The Driver, if you've ever seen it with Ryan O'Neill and uh, Bruce Dern. Very interesting psychological, uh, fantastic car, ch I mean, great film, but it really hit the wall. So here's it. In Hollywood, you don't get that many chances. So he was under so much pressure. And I believe that failure is the mother of success. So that because this was an ostensible failure, the driver, he had to bear down on the warriors and insist that it become a success. He had to make it a success. And because he was a rather tenacious individual, he stuck with it, and that's why it was so successful. If someone else is in that position of hunger and drive and need, they could take the Warriors or any other project and probably have the same results. That's my two cents. Thank you. So, uh, put the thought, uh, ugh, let you guys answer a question, um, ask a question. Thank you so much, you guys, for coming. I'd never thought in my lifetime I'd meet any of you guys. Um, could I ask you, what was your favourite scene of the movie, please? Uh, now, I know you guys are going to think this is a little funny, but uh, I enjoyed being with the Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a little break in the action. <laughs> So I, obviously this is one of my favorite scenes, but actually uh, uh, I think my most favorite scene is the fight with the baseball theories. But Walter did that. I mean, the seven samurais and that whole stylized thing, and I'll, I'll take that bat and shove it up your ass and turn you into a popsicle. <laughs> I mean, that's it, yeah. just 
amazing, amazing shot, amazing, amazing scene. And, uh, you know. Um, Dorsey, what do you think? Can project. <laughs> you stage heard actor. me, stage oh, actor. So you you heard me without the microphone, because I project from the diaphragm, <laughs> and I do not have to yell. Thank you. No, uh, my favorite scene, believe it or not, was Cleon's death. I mean, other than the stuff that was pulled out, because I got to work with Pamela Poitier, the stuff that I liked of me was actually the death the de the death sequence which I thought was amazing. First of all, I always wanted to do like a horror film or something. I always wanted to do like a fight scene. And it was like, here it is. Even though it looked like at times I was a real cripple doing it. But you know, hey, I enjoyed that because it meant something for the character to die in the film, if you know what I mean. It's like, okay, this isn't gonna be one of those movies where everybody lives. And I died. And it was like, that's cool to me. Because then my friends all go, and you do too. Did you really die in the movie? No, I'm standing right in front of you. The character died. But to me, that, that, was, that was one of the best scenes that I was in. Other than that, once I was gone, that movie took off like a rocket. So, unlike you, it got better when I got back. <laughs> I, I loved Marcelino. Uh, the guy who played Rembrandt, and he's unfortunately no longer with us, and we're, uh, we're the lesser because of it. He was the sweetest boy, the kindest. I never heard a negative comment come out of the kid's mouth. He was a little angel, really. And I love the scene where he was walking around when they, I guess you guys were with the Lizzie's? Yeah, 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 yeah. And Marcelino was walking around going, something's wrong here, you know. <laughs> uh, that, to me, it was a really great great scene because you got inside the character's mind you could see what he was thinking and that's a result of the collaboration between the r director and the actor and really you are missing something by not knowing uh, Marcelino um, you know I don't know how to describe it to you other than to say uh, we were under some tough circumstances you know it gets tough out there late at night it's hot people yelling at you and but the kid he was he was imperturbable, you know, he was just unruffled. He just kept his cool, he never got upset about anything, he was always cheerful and loving and kind and gentle and, you know, I think we all deserve to, he was a big part of the movie and I think we all deserve to take a moment and realize how great he was, you know. That's what I have to say about that. There Almost was certainly. Building, there, was a, there was a lot of people. I feel, I feel sometimes that when we do this, that, that we, we should. We, we should take a moment for Marcelino and a whole lot of people. Ed, Ed Sewell. I mean, people walk up to me all the time, and they do that, you know, where are the warriors? The guy with the sunglasses, Ed Sewell, who became a friend of mine. It was like a year and a half after the movie came out. Died of cancer. He never got to see any of this. Uh, Big pen. Hot lips. Love the lips. Um, there was a lot of not just uh, character actors, but first time people. I mean, straight out the gate, first time, never did anything that aren't here today to go. Damn. With that, and that's what gets me. They're not here to go. We never thought, we were in the business. We're card carrying members. There were guys who, and girls, who just stepped into us and said, yo, I'm gonna do a film. And today, their minds would be blown. They, they really would. They, they, they could never get over this. That, that's the only hurtful thing to me is that they missed this. You know, one way or the other, if I wasn't here after I made it, See their films, see the card carrying members. They never got to see this. The people like Ed Sewell, Marcelino Sanchez was a star in his, in his own right. That's just like get that twisted. I don't know if outside of the small screen, if 
I don't know his full story, or his big story. But I met his sister and his family. And they're like, oh, thank God you carry him. Because when you watch the film, a lot of those guys and girls that you go, wow, they really, they're not here for that. I think every now and then, you know, when we do these, we really need to have a, an homage to the people who, hey, glued the rest of this film together. There's the nine guys and the girl, but there's a lot of people that glued this together that you fans actually know lines of. A lot of people, it was their first time out. It is sad. So has anyone got any questions? <laughs> Hello. If by any chance they do make a remake, which actors would you like to see play your partner? Mickey Mouse could play Fox. <laughs> Bugs Bunny could play <laughs> Cochise. <laughs> Bugs Bunny. Oh, the Road Runner could play Cleon. No, I, I have no clue who would, you know. Uh, there's a lot of very uh, talented young actors out there in Hollywood if they were to remake it. I think what happened with the last time they tried uh, to remake it is they tried to use real bloods and crips yeah. Yeah. and it got you know uh, the animosity between them became real and so they couldn't uh, turn it into a movie but they're supposedly they're doing it on Hulu as a TV show that's my understanding yes. so the cartoon cart cart the cart they're supposed to make a cartoon of it too yes. yeah, Saturday morning cartoon I had to audition for the uh, video game. My manager called me and said, you have an audition today? I said, oh yeah, what for? And she said, well, it's for a video game of the Warriors. <laughs> I said, yeah, I was in that. And she goes, I know. I go, you mean I have to audition for myself? <laughs> she said, yes. <laughs> And this is what happens when you are in this business and you have children and health insurance and you need a job. I went in and auditioned and the guy said, I just wanted to see if you had ruined your voice from cigarettes or drinking like some people have and you haven't. So you, and I sound almost exactly the same. And uh, so I got the part. So the lesson there is don't smoke and drink and you just might get another chance to play yourself. <laughs> Has anybody else got any questions? Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so you said that you played yourself in the game. Um, what did you think of the backstory that was given to all of your characters? I, 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 thought, I thought some of that, some parts, and I spoke to some people today. I, 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 I spoke to some people today, a couple of guys. I don't know if they're, yeah, 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 you. <laughs> It's a disgusting human being back there. He beats up drunks. <laughs> no, me and him, we had a discussion. He said, have you played the game? I played it like once, maybe twice. But what I didn't like about the game, in order to learn how to fight in the game, you beat up drunk, homeless men. <laughs> Look at your face. That's how I felt. And I'm going, that's like really creepy. And what was the line you said they say? Something about the wine. Earn your wine. Yeah, do, do, do it for your booze. Do it for your booze. Yeah. You paid him five quid, though. Huh? You paid him five quid. Yeah, okay. That part of the game tripped me out. But, but the game itself, it, 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 was, it was some of the harmless other than that. But that one point alone made me tell my son, you, you can't play this game. Because you're basically beating up homeless people to learn how to, you know, fight through the rest of the game. So, and I didn't have to audition. <laughs> they like called me and said, real quick, I'm sitting at home. A, a girl that I knew calls me and says, because she got those game books. Hey, they're doing the Warriors video game. And I'm sitting at home going, yeah. Can I make me some money off of this? So I look and there's Rockstar. So I called Rockstar Canada. 
Rockstar LA, Rockstar New York. I said, hey, I'm Dorsey Wright, and the joke was, because they had the picture, why am I so damn ugly on the, on the cartoon rendition of it? And I hung up. 20 minutes later, they called me back at home. I left my number. And they said, is this Dorsey Wright? I'm like, who the hell is this? It says, Rockstar. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> they said, uh, so you're Dorsey Wright? If I send you some lines, and I'll try to do like this. If I send you some lines, could you read them back to us? I said, yeah, OK. So they sent me you know, the opening scene routine. And I read it back to the guy I had to call him back and read. And he was like, so would you mind coming down to Rockstar in the village? So I'm like, yeah, OK, I'll come down there. We're reading and reading. And then I had to tell the guy, look, I still got a job, man. So I can't be down here for like four or five days. I can give you like you know, one day or two days, my day off. And we got to bust this out. The guy was like, it can't be done in two days. I don't think that engineer works there anymore. Because there's amazing stuff you can do when you got to go back to your job and they offer you that amount of money just to do, read this? Oh, my man, it's going to be done in two days because you're going to get another damn job. I'm making this money and I'm going back. But I didn't get to see any of y'all. I missed y'all. So the game itself, y'all were playing it downstairs. What did y'all think? Of course you clap. Everybody else except you. <laughs> See, there it is, there it is. That answers the whole thing. Ta -da. <laughs> Next question. Yeah, so we've got enough time for another three questions. Um, but I ate up their time. They can ask more than three questions. Come on. What happened to Ajax um, after when he went to jail? After Ajax went to jail, he got 86. We don't know what he did in jail. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, Jay, you know, he wouldn't find some action, right? He, he wouldn't listen to Swan, right? <laughs> so he found his action, unfortunately, in the big house. <laughs> he became a born again Christian. No, listen, I have to go because uh, I'm going to be playing in a little while and I have to go get my head together for that. But listen, I want to thank you all so much for coming and uh, the guys will take over for me after this. Thank you so much. Yeah, you packed to Thomas. Tom Waits, the Fox. Wait. Tom Waits, the Give Fox. Give him another clap. <laughs> So we now ask a question. What was it like working with Walter Hill? Working with Walter? Yeah. Um, I mean, what could a young actor want more? I mean, Walter's brilliant. Walter's kind. Walter, he never yelled at us. He never lost his temper. He never bugged out like some directors will do. He was under, a as Tom said, a tremendous amount of stress because his last movie kind of bombed. And, you know, those lawyers, I call them nothing but lawyers in Hollywood, the money people, do you know what I mean? Are saying, uh, 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 you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, he never showed that to us. He was always like, okay, guys, you know, we got to do this again. I know you already ran this scene. 27 times, but we got we to gotta run 20, 28 times, you know, because we just got to get it from a better angle. But uh, he was a gem. He was, uh, you know, you had a saying, uh, well, I don't know if it's here in the UK, but who's your daddy? Walter was the captain of the ship. It, it was like not having a director, if you know what I mean. He was confident, he knew what he was doing. But it was just somebody telling you, hey, look, can we do it this way? Yeah, sure, let's do it that way. So I didn't look at him as a director. I looked at him as, hey, here's a guy from California who wants to put a film together. That's it, no pressure, none. There was no screaming, there was none of that. I've been on films where you knew who the director was. You knew who the first, that second director was. You knew who was basically doing costume, because they let you know. Walter was the opposite of all of those people. I mean, you look at a crowd and go, where the hell is the director? Just think, 
bummy looking guy sitting there just looking at him. He gets up and says, hey, can we try it this way? And you go, yeah, okay. Okay, guys, let's shoot. That was it. I, I hate that. I know you want to hear more, you know, like he was, no, he wasn't, man. He was just like you, just another dude, another bloke going, let's try and shoot this again, okay? And he sat down. That was it. What do you want, man? Great. Did you guys get to keep any of the original wardrobe, any of the clothing, any of the memorabilia stuff? Or My story is ridiculous, <laughs> so I let him go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Walter was very, very gracious. He let us keep everything. He was very gracious. We wrap, last scene, done, the movie's finished. Can we keep this? It's yours. Okay, the necklace my son was teething. He chewed that up. The rag I had on my head, that was his, what do we call that? Something crazy he, my wife came up with. It was like his security blanket, so he would not let that go. So both of those were shredded to nothing. Um, the sneakers, why would I even keep those? They were spray painted over very bad looking converses. Uh, the pants, Ain't no way in the world I was keeping those daggone pants. I, it's just not my style. I don't, I, I don't flow like that. Now, the vest. I had a so-called friend, who I'm not going to mention his name, because I made a mistake in New Jersey and mentioned this guy's name. Yeah. And like five or six fans mm, came up to me and said, you want your vest back, man? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> they had his name, so they were ready to go check. I don't say his name no more. But I loaned him my vest, he's a fellow actor, to go take some pictures in it. By this time, the movie wasn't the way it is now, but it got some recognition. It was just starting to get there. So I loaned him my damn vest. And he never showed up again. He never brought my vest back. What can I say, good friend? I knew him for like five years. So he just basically broke up our friendship over a vest. I've never seen him after that. But if anybody's in New Jersey, happens to see a guy with a vest on, has my name in it. <laughs> no, 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 but that, that's what happened to it. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of costumes or wardrobes that you look at as nothing. You, you, you really can't see into the future and say, hey, this is gonna be worth anything. Just a job you did. Of course, 20 years later you go, fuck. But that's the way life is meant to be, man. I mean, hey, something you could have got here from us today that we signed. God forbid something stupid happened. And 10 years later, man, you know you left it in storage or your kid played with it. And all of a sudden, cha-ching time and you go, fuck. <laughs> now you know how I felt with my vest. You'll just sit there and go, that's the same way he felt about his damn vest but you won't have a name unless you just look in the mirror because that's who Matt went up. I'm really sorry, guys, but we're going to have to wrap it up. We've got time for one more question. One more? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm running over there. This is for Dorsey. Why do you think Cleon went back to Cyrus's body to look at it? What? <laughs> Slowly, what do you say? Why do you think Cleon went back to where Cyrus was to look at his body? What was the reason? Why did he abandon his friends? <laughs> Maybe Cleon thought he was a hot looking dude. I don't know. <laughs> 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 Why did he just run? Why did he actually have to go back home? Because he wouldn't have got his ass whipped. No, and, and he said, oh, he stuck with us. No, that was not a typical New York or brother man move. Uh, normally it would be, shit, he got shot. I'm over here. Bye. <laughs> well, right, I'm bye. Why did he go back? You never, never thought, that's like the best question. Good question, man. Because he was an idiot. <laughs> I mean, really, he was, he was an idiot. You're in somebody else's. I told all, I, he tells all his boys, go run, run, run for your life. What are you going to do? War leader. 
I'm gonna go over here and look at the dead body that just got shot with all the bad guys around me and go, damn, that's like fucked up, he got shot. And then, then look at everybody and go, what? I, I didn't do nothing. Yes, you did, you idiot. You stuck around and look at the corpse. Thank you.